Good morning. Thank you. All right. Let everybody get settled in. Everybody getting their coffee on? Good. We're not we're not waiting for you. It's 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 all right. All right, let's get excited about the word, amen. A.W. Tozer once said, we cannot pray in love and live in hate and still think we're serving God. Amen. This was, this is a side one for you. The one that doesn't tell you what you want to hear but tells you what you need to hear Keep that person. Just just try to remember that as we go forward. Amen? So let me address something real quick just at the beginning here before we get started. Um, Our nation is mourning. People are hurting. Puerto Rico, Texas, Miami, the islands, Mexico gets hit again. People are searching for answers, and some people have been praying for the first time in their lives. And when, when something is out of your control, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it, some people pray. Some people turn to God. Some. Now, the ones who prayed and found their loved ones are okay, perhaps, perhaps they'll start building a relationship with God, perhaps. The ones who prayed and found out something other than what they prayed for, they're going to have some hard questions to ask. So now more than ever before, the church has to be the church. Amen? The church has to be the sanctuary, the beacon of hope, the lighthouse, the refuge. And so as, as the church, we pray and we cover and we assist in any way and any how that we can. We stand in the gap and we shine a light in the darkness. Amen. We've already contacted a couple of organizations. And what I'd like to be doing pretty soon is setting up a team from here to go and, and to build and to clean and to build houses. I want to take a, a, a construction team with us. Amen. I'd love to take some of our young people and just rock them that way. Because we're here to talk today about serving people. But the word, uh, the word tells us, Romans 8 tells us that the whole of creation groans and travails in pain since the fall of man and the corruption of sin. The natural world is groaning as it waits for the creator to restore the earth to a fully redeemed condition. And I don't consider it fortunate or coincidence that we started a series titled Church 101. I think it's time we forget what you heard, forget what's been done. Listen to me. If you've been hurt by the church or its leaders in the past, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But this isn't, here isn't there. And it's time to get past that, and it's time to be the church that God has called us to be. Amen? So Church 101, what you need to know about the church and what you should know about us. And what I'm doing in this three-part series is just breaking down the vision of this church as we talk about the global church. Amen? So three weeks, enjoying God, serving people, building healthy families. That's our, our, our mission, our vision statement. Last week, we talked about enjoying God. Last week, I used an illustration using a couple of bugs because my, my granddaughter's always making me look up bugs, right? And I showed you a couple of bugs. One was a praying mantis, and I, and I showed you a bunch of things, and, and uh, we talked about how God puts so much detail and color and, and things, even in the littlest things that are insignificant to us, like a bug. Well, God is so awesome that later on in that week, I came home, and, and, and I found this. Right on my front door. (laughs) 
right on my front door. Bugs. See, you guys can write me on Facebook and Instagram and you can tell me, hey, I heard that message. It was, it was boring as whatever or it was great or it ministered to me, whatever. But only God can manifest and show me and send the bug to my house that I use for an illustration to tell me that he heard the message. Amen? And that's what I'm talking about, enjoying God, enjoying our walk with him, enjoying our journey, enjoying the, invent- the, the adventures, that, that we can talk about something and God can manifest it. If you're not enjoying God that way, you're doing it wrong, man. You're just being religious. Let go of the religion, amen? Tell somebody, take your religious pants off today, man. Put some earrings. God don't care if you have earrings or not. I'm sorry. Now I'm stepping on people's. All right. All right. Let's let's get to the word. Church 101, enjoying God, serving people. So when when I think about serving people, the picture, this was very difficult for me this week. It was a hard week with everything that's going on and everything that we're experiencing and dealing with. And so the picture that I settled on this week was the picture from the last night that Jesus spent with the church. The last night that he would have, that he spent with those group of disciples that he had gathered and walked with and done life with for three years. He'd walk with these guys for, for three years. These are, these are the men that he's encountered and, and at one point or another he's called to follow him. He met this one by the water, and he said, follow me. And he, he met this one at a gathering, and he said, you, you, and you, follow me. And, and he met eventually out of a crowd of followers and everybody, he picked 12 of the men to be with him, to be this, this first church. And just a side note, Jesus, who didn't need anyone, chose to live in community. That's, that's a good note. Keep that one. Jesus, who didn't need anybody chose to live in community, to do life together with people. He didn't need anyone. Most of the time, all these guys did was get in the way. Amen? Most of the time, all they did was start drama. You know the church. All they did was mess things up. Jesus taught us that living in community was messy, that being part of a church is messy, that it's awkward at times, it's difficult at times, it can go bad at times, you can get hurt at times, but it's worth it. Amen? Come on, if you found that in your heart, can you say amen? It's worth it. It's risky, but it's worth it. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Doma. So it's clear from the text that he's handpicked this first church. This would be the church that he sent out to build and to teach every other church. And, and they're, they're going to be the men that he's entrusting the gospel with. And, and they're going to tell the story. They're going to be the ones that are going to change the world. And yet, he doesn't pick a dream team. I want you to see this. This is important. These guys constantly blew it. They rarely got it. He always had to explain things to them privately, right? He'd go and do some things, and he'd be with them, and they'd be like, yeah, what he said, yeah. And then they'd go back, and he said, Jesus, we don't know what you were talking about. What, what, what did you mean by that? What do, what, do you, what do you mean? And he'd have to be like, ah, oh, and explain, right? So he didn't, they, they, and, and, and he, 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 had, he handpicked this team, but he didn't pick a dream team. And that goes against anything that we ever thought about for success. Say amen. That goes against all good practices. In business, what, what do you have? Can you guys kind of kill this? This up here is really blaring. 
In, in the business world, we have resumes and interviews, and we want the best person for the job. We want the one with the most experience. We want the one with the most education. We want with the one with the best attitude, with the best skills. In sports, we see that even more, right? We want that one, that one guy, man, or girl that, that has the best averages, that has the best um, um, personality, the best skills. The best. We've seen in sports, in teams, how we trade two or three people for one player. Isn't that nuts? Good sports reference, even though I know nothing about sports. Thank you. But we see, because the goal is to win. But, but, so Jesus can build by hand the first team to do community with. And let's take a look at who he picks. Let's consider Peter. Peter was impulsive. Peter was an extrovert. Do we know anybody like that? He spoke first and thought later. He, he was always the voice in the room. You asked a question, he answered it. That wasn't talking to you. It was rhetorical. He's answering. He don't even know what he's talking about, but he'll answer it. He, he takes charge when, 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 even though he didn't know what he was doing. He was the first to confess that Jesus is the Christ, and he impressed everybody. He was also the first to deny him three times. He was the first to step out of the boat and walk on the water. He was also the first to take the L when he took his eyes off Jesus and sank and almost drowned. Success, failure, success, failure, success, failure. Anybody know people like that? But yet God chose him and loved him and made him part of the church. James and John, they were called the sons of thunder. You know what that means? They needed anger management classes. They were hotheads. They were, they were temperamental. They got offended easy. They got upset easy. They overreacted all the time. They, they say too much. They go, go too far. <coughs> One time a village rejected Jesus. That he, They were preaching and the village rejected Jesus. And he wanted to call down fire from heaven to destroy the village. Jesus rebuked them that time. But he still accepted him and made them part of the church. Andrew. Andrew was like this all-around good guy. He was likable. He was a connector. He was a network type of person. He was the one that always introduced people and connected. He said, hey, you know this one? Oh, man, come on. Let me introduce. And he's, he's the one going back and forth introducing people and not listening to anybody. But he's always intro- connecting people. He was a net- he's the one that introduced Peter to Jesus. And so he was friendly and helpful and personable. Thank God Jesus loved those type of people too and adds them to the church. But then there was Simon, Simon the Zealot. In contrast to Andrew, Simon was probably not so likable. You guys are going to know people like this. He was probably a lot more opinionated. Zealots were a political activist group who were opposed to the Romans. And so probably fair to assume that he was the one that's always talking about politics. He's the one you hear in church, hey, praise God, yeah, but I hate Trump. And, oh, but you think, you see what Trump did, you see what I pray, and he's always talking politics. He's always, always want to talk about the political and the social and, and what's going on in the world. Always complaining about the way things are done, yet God chose Simon the Zealot and added him to the church. Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. He was, they called him a sellout because he wasn't Roman, but he worked for the Romans, collecting taxes. He was a subcontractor, and, and, and he made sure he took advantage of that. He knew what, you know, you know what I'm saying? Sticky, you know, whatever. So his own people saw him as a sellout. He had a pretty bad reputation. Not the background you want to have with Simon the Zealot in the room, but yet his background and his rap sheet doesn't deter Jesus from choosing him and adding him to the group. His background doesn't stop Jesus from using him and adding him to the church. How about Thomas? He must have been a fun guy. He became famous for his commitment to unbelief. I know people like that. He was slow to believe, he was cynical, he was always ready to counter God's promises with, well, I don't know, I don't know about that. And Jesus doesn't love him any less, still chooses him. Even when he doubted him and said, I need to put my finger in the nail holes, Jesus made a special appearance to him and said, go ahead, put your finger in the nail hole. 
Then there was Philip. Philip was the numbers guy. He was the computer guy. The guy always had a had an iPad or a, or a laptop. The guy was, he was the the needy, the you know the nerdy kind of geeky dude. But those are the guys that make money, the smart guys, right? And so he was always thinking logically, and he was always find the reasons why something couldn't be done. So when when Jesus tried to tried to tell the disciples feed the five thousand, he was the one that said, "Wait a minute." He did the math in his head. He calculated the cost per head multiplied by an estimate number of people present, and then he reported to Jesus, "Even if we had two hundred denarii, we wouldn't be able to do this. This is impossible." So this is the type of guy that will not step out in faith for nothing. It has to be logical. Do we know anybody like that? And God chose him and added him to the church. We don't know much about Bartholomew, James, the son of Alphaeus, or Judas, the son of James. They were a private, apparently very quiet, private people. They were probably introverts. Anybody know any introverts? Jesus loved the introverts so much, he chose three of them to be on his team of 12. And then, of course, there was Judas, the traitor. Judas was a straight fake. He was the one that was there in church for all the wrong reasons. I know there's nobody here like that today, but, but we know those kind of people. Amen? He was probably interested in material gain. He'd be the one in here that just wants to come to church because there's a lot of people that he can sell Amway to. Or Mary Kay or whatever else. And I'm, if you're selling that here, I'm not saying, you know, but, but I'm talking about Judas. He was probably interested in material gain or power. And why would Jesus choose to add him to the church? Could it be that even in his lineup, he was giving us Church 101? Bear with me. Could it be that there are going to be people who are extroverts and, 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 and there are going to be people who are going to embarrass you sometime? Could he maybe have been telling us, look, this is how you build the church. There are going to be people that are extroverts and they're going to embarrass you and they're going to put their foot in their mouth all the time. Risk it anyway. There are going to be people, they are going to be those who only think logically and they'll never step out in faith. Encourage them and take them with you anyway. They're going to be those people that are the emotional type. They'll get offended every time. But pastor didn't say hi to me. But pastor didn't smile at me. But pastor's wife doesn't come and greet me ever. But, but, and, and they're going to be the emotional type. And, 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 and Jesus is saying love on them anyway. Include them anyway. You have the loud ones that will never shut up, the quiet ones that just want to be alone, but they want to be part of a community. Make space for them too. You have the ones that question everything you do and doubt that it would ever work, but they belong there too. There will be those that are connectors and they'll always be networking and making connections even when you're talking. Let them. Let them. I'm going to use them too. There'll be those that stand with you through it all and those that will deny you when things get difficult. You'll have those that will be closer to you than the rest and those that you might never know too much about, but they're included too. There'll be those who have some questionable backgrounds. Give them a place to belong to. Come on, say amen. There'll be those that doubt you and they'll need extra hand holding and there'll be those that will tell you how impossible what you're trying to do will be. Build their faith by using them to do impossible things too. There'll also be those that'll be with you for all the wrong reasons. Who when you're at your most vulnerable will sell you out to the highest bidder if they could. Jesus says include them anyway. Work with them anyway. Serve them anyway. And, and so the picture that Jesus gives us about serving people on the last day that he had to spend with those, that church that he gathered, those that are going to carry on after him. <clears throat> you would imagine that you wouldn't want to waste any time. This is our last night together. What am I going to talk to you about? What am I going to share with you? And so, what, 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 what am I, what, whatever, I'm not going to waste time talking about things that are not important. Amen? This is our last time. And the word says that in John 13, he leaves the meal. 
He removes his outer garments and he ties a towel around his waist. He pours water into a basin and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. To understand the scene and the weight of this, you have to understand that this action was something that was always done by a servant. When people traveled to a dinner or a feast in that time, they would bathe and they would put on their fancy batas and, and their, you know, whatever, and they would get all dressed up. But they, they only had chanclas back then. So they were open toe. And so the roads weren't paved, and so they were dusty and dirty. So you could be, you know, fine to death up here, but your feet now have walked through these paths, and they're dirty. They're full of dust, and and they're full of dirt, right? No matter how clean and how much dracar you put on, right? That's for your 80s heads. And so by the time, and so then the way they would sit at this dinner, it wasn't like, you know, we sit at these big tables with chairs and your feet are hidden underneath. They would sit low, and so their feet are there by the food. And so the last thing you want to sit around people and eat food is with nasty, dirty, stinky, dusty feet. And so there would always be a, a part of the dinner before you entered there that someone would, would give you a wash basin and they would wash your feet so that you can sit with clean feet and have, a, have dinner. But that would always be the role of a servant. This was a private dinner. Nobody else was there. And so there was no one there to wash the feet. And so, and the disciples, they still haven't gotten it. We, we just read earlier that they were still arguing about who's going to be the greatest. That's what they were arguing. He's called them for the last time together. We're going to have our last meal together. I'm going to die. They're going to commit me. And they're like, they're not getting it. They're talking to each other about, yeah, so you think I'm, I think I'm going to be the greatest one. I think I'm going to be the one that sits next to him. No, I already talked to him. I want, I want to sit on his right side when we go into the kingdom. And that's what they're talking about. So he, they're not getting it. So Jesus gets off the table. He said, I want to give them one last picture. I want to show them what it's like to serve people. He takes off his, his outer garments. He puts on a towel around his waist and he washes their feet. And he gets up from the table and takes a position as a servant. And he says to them, verse 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord and you're right for so I am. I'm the Lord. I'm your teacher. I'm the master. You call me that and you're right because so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Catch this. When you you continue to read the passage, the next thing he does is he settles it with Judas. He says, Uh, Listen, one of you here is going to betray me. And it's almost as if he was giving Judas that one last time. Like, it doesn't have to be you that sends me up. It doesn't have to be you. He was giving him, he said, one of you here is going to betray me. But as it transpires, it says Satan entered Judas and Judas. And so he said, listen, what you're going to do, go do quickly. He said, bete. Judas leaves. And so now he sits with the rest of them and, and, and he says, look, this is what I want to leave with you. He says, there's something that I really want you to get. So, so I, I, I think this is his thinking, God's thinking. There's something that I want you to get. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a command. Because up until this point, you're not getting it. I'm going to make it a command. He says in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, people are going to know that you're my disciples. By this. So he just took off his, his, his priestly and, and put on his servanthood. And he said, by this, they're going to know that you do what I'm doing. Serve people. And then you know he's about to go lay down his life. He says, I need you to love one another the way I love you. He's saying, you know who I am and you see what I've done, the way I've served you, I want you to serve people. If you read down a little further in in, in the book of John, he's done talking to them now. And John lets us in on on this little prayer that he prays to, to the Father on our behalf. He says, Holy Father, 
Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 20, he says, I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's me and you today. So he's praying for me and you today. Back then, 2,000 years ago, he was praying for you sitting here in the Bronx. He says, I don't only ask for them, but also for those who would believe in your word through them, that they may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Listen, this is the church that Jesus built. It's not perfect. It doesn't get it right all the time, but it's the church that Jesus is praying for. He's praying that you and I would learn how to be one, that we would learn how to overcome the obstacles that we need to overlook, the insecurities that, and set those aside, the baggage that we come and try with everything we have, with all that we are to love one another. Family, when you and I, listen, please, this is it. This is, I'm finishing, please. When you and I are not one anothering one another, we're not following the command that Jesus gave us. And we're actually working against his prayers. How can any prayer that we pray be effective if we're working against the prayers that he's praying? Why would he overlook his prayers to hear your prayers if your prayers are not in line with his prayers. I heard a preacher say once, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Listen, there's a few things that I'm passionate about sharing. I love talking about creation, man. I love that. I love talking about grace because I live that. And I love talking about the local church. When people badmouth the church, I, I get so tight, I get crispy. I get like, I, I, get, I get hurt, man. I get broke. I get mad. I get violent in my head. I've like punched people in the face while they were talking in my mind. I'm not perfect. Don't judge me. And people tell me, people always tell me, don't take it personally. You can't take it personally. They're not leaving you. It's not you. It's the church. I said, no, maybe that's the problem with the church. We don't take it personally. Because if someone's talking about the church, they're talking about me. They're talking about us because we're the church. We can't choose when we're the church and when we're not the church. Oh, I'm not the church when they're talking bad about the church, but I am the church when they're talking good about the church. No, you're the church. So if someone's trashing the church, you're being trashed. Take it personally. Because <coughs> our culture and our society today right now are really big on trashing the church. People have evolved, and this is Christians now I'm talking about. I'm not even talking about the world. Christians. People have evolved in their minds that the church is irrelevant and whatever they can get at church, they can get at home and do it alone. And I'll tell you, that's probably the enemy's greatest strategy to date. Strat you know what I said. <laughs> His greatest strategy today is to dismantle and dilute the power of the church. By telling you, you can get anything you can get here, you can get at home. You can download sermons. You can hear the word of God. You can download sermons from all over the world. You can hear the word of God on, on, on YouTube. On your, all you need is an internet connection and speakers. If you want worship, you can download the biggest and you know, whatever worship teams from anywhere in the world. And you can have that. And you should. But that's extra. I'm not telling you not to do that, but that's extra. That's like you get a good meal here on Sunday, that's not going to last you the next Sunday. Tomorrow you got to eat too. And Tuesday you got to eat too. And Wednesday you got to eat too. Amen? So, so you can download. The problem though is you can't subtract the church from God's plans. 
Every book of the New Testament was written in the context of the faith community. Follow me. It's impossible for the reader to avoid. The church is so embedded in biblical thought that if you contemplate having a solitary Christian life, you're actually contemplating a life that doesn't exist. A lone Christian keeps everything uncomplicated. Fine, there's no worship wars, there's no gossip, there's no bickering, there's no organizational burnout, but there's also no fullness of Christ. All the follow me's of Christ was him adding someone to a group of one another's. Acayito. This theme, listen, this theme is so prevalent throughout the New Testament that there are 100 one another commands. I'm going to read them all to you right now. I'm kidding. But, but there are 100 one another commands. Sample, love one another, John 13. Edify one another, Romans 14. Receive one another, Romans uh, 15. Forgive one another, Ephesians 4. Be members of one another, Romans 12. I love that, a hashtag, member of you. I am a member of you. You're a member of me. Do you? I mean, that picture is so beautiful. We're members. We, we're not like members of Planet Fitness. We pay $19.99 a month. No, we're members of each other. I don't have a membership card. It's a spiritual thing. If you want a card, I'll make you a card. But we're members. It's in Rome. The card is found in Romans 12, 5. <coughs> Rip it out. Honor one another, Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another, Romans 12. Rejoice with one another, Romans 12. Serve one another, Galatians 5. Uh, carry one another's burdens. Come on, this is the church, Galatians 6. Encourage one another, First Thess. When was the last time you encouraged somebody in here? The mentality of the church is, let me come in to get. And you sit here and we get. And, and, man, the preaching was whack. That guy was boring. I, they did the songs I hate. That, it's not, come on, man. You, you came in with the wrong intention. Amen? We, we encourage one another. Where are we one anothering each other? Serve one another, Galatians 5. Rejoice with one another, Romans 12. Carry one another's burdens, Galatians 6. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians. Be hospitable to one another, 1 Peter 4. Confess your sins to one another, James 5. Pray for one another, James. If we break down our vision statement, you cannot enjoy God without serving people. I didn't even know this when we chose this 12 years ago. God's unfolding this thing. We weren't that smart back then. He's just, we were just a group of dummies that he brought together and said, look, I'm going to use the foolish things of this world to, confide the, to confound the wise. Amen? But you can't enjoy God without serving people, and you won't build healthy families without enjoying God and without serving people. Say Amen. If we're not one anothering one another, we're not doing this thing right and we're failing church 101. Oh, but that guy gets on my nerves. Be at peace with one another, Mark 9. Man, she's always starting something. She don't shut up. Don't grumble among one another, John 6. Accept one another. Cover one another. It's a bochinchera, but we be of the same mind with one another. Encourage, encourage her to not be a bochinchera. Can you, can you get, listen, listen. You, you have two people when it comes to bochinche. That means gossip for those of you that don't know Spanish. TSF Espanol, church starts at 2 o'clock. Um, uh, uh, uh. When there's two people when it comes to gossip and when it comes to drama and when it comes, it's the person that comes, listen, listen. Did you hear this? And, and it's the other person that says, oh my God. Que, que? Serious? I knew it. I didn't even like her husband. I knew it. I knew that dude was like that. Right? It takes two. But if we encourage one another, somebody comes and says, bro, you see homeboy over there? And then he thinks, listen, 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 bro. Let me encourage you, bro. If you got a problem with that dude, like, let's go grab him. Let's sit together. Let's huddle this thing out. Let's one another each other for a minute. Amen? 
And look how quick that dies because now that person, either they get one anothered or they, I need to find somebody else to talk to. Because that sister's not hearing stuff. She's no fun. She's stupid. She's religious. Don't grumble among one another, John 6. We be of the same mind with one another. Accept one another, Romans 15. One third of the one another commands deal with the unity in the church. One third of a hundred. Who's the math guy here? All right. 33 point what? Very good. Well, kind of point, right? I got you. All right, Philip, take it easy. One third of the one another commands deal with the unity of the church. So when we're on Facebook making stupid comments about the church, you're the problem. If you have a problem with somebody in here, get in here and one another that thing. Until it's over, until it's dead. And then there's 99 more one another's to get through with this dude. We got our hands full, don't we? You thought, that, oh, I just have to show up in church and, you know, throw $2 in the offering and I'm good, you know. I met requirements, check. I went to church, check. I tithe, check. I did this, check. No. There's 99 more one another's that you had to do before you walked out this door. Did you get two or three of them done? If you have a, all right, gently, patiently tolerate one another, Ephesians 4. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving to one another, Ephesians 4. Bear with and forgive one another, Colossians 3. Seek God for one another and don't repay evil for you. Seek God for one another. Wow. I was just seeking God for me. I just want God for me. I just want good, and I want blessing, and I want, I want goodness, and I want mercy, and I want grace. But, but, not, but, but I want, God says, seek it for one another. Man, is, does that change, church? Don't complain against one another, James 4 and James 5. He put it in there twice. He says, don't complain about one another. If you have a problem, one another, one another, until you have nothing to complain about one another. Wow, this is theology, man. This is amazing, isn't it? Worship team come. They're getting restless. One third of the other one another's instruct Christians to love one another. A third, which is 33.3 point, point whatever, Encourage Christians to love one another. It's, it's almost embarrassing that God has to tell us that so many times. Love one another. Watch John 13, John 15, John 17, Romans 13, 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, 1 Peter 1, 1, Peter, 1 John 3, 1 John 4, 1 John 11, 2 John 5. Every writer of the Bible had to tell us, love one another. Through love, serve one another, Galatians 5. Tolerate one. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> he said, but I can't love them. Okay, then tolerate one another until you can love them. Wow. I can't love them. I know it says 33 times to love him, but I can't. Okay, then for right now, tolerate him until God works in you. We're all a work in progress, amen? I'm preaching this and living it. I got to live it, amen? We're trying. We're not, nobody's, I ain't beating up on nobody. I ain't angry at nobody. I'm, I'm trying to live this thing, and I'm trying to bring us through to live this thing. I'm just trying to one another or some of you one another's. 1 Peter 5 says, greet one another. Watch this. I sit, I stand, especially when I'm not preaching, I sit sometimes in the worship thing and I watch. Some of you slip into church, slip out of the church, didn't greet one person, except for the five ushers that made you hug them, but that was mandatory anyway. But you slip in and you slip out. You didn't greet one person in the church. You're not one another in one another. 
Greet one another, it says, First Peter. Check it out. Say hi to somebody. That's church 101. Hey, how you doing? You, I, ne- I don't even know your name. Hey, how you doing, bro? Bless you. Be devoted to one another, Romans 12. Give preference to one another in honor, Romans 12. Regard one another as more important. Wow. That's rough. We come in here like I'm better than you. I dress better. I look better. I'm nicer. I'm a better Christian. I read better than you. I pray better than you. Be devoted. Give preference to one another in honor. Regard one another as more important, Philippians 2. Serve one another, Galatians 5. Wash one another's feet. That's a beautiful picture. That's not saying nobody take off your shoes. We're gonna. That's not what he says there. That was needed in that time. In context, that was a way to bless somebody. That was a service. What do we do today? Today, I don't, we have socks, we have shoes, we have pavement, we come in the car. How do we wash somebody's feet today? Figure that out. Be of the same mind as one another. Be subject to one another. Close yourselves in humility toward one another. What would the church look like if we took this one command with 94 verses seriously and actually walked them out? See, if we get busy one anothering one another, we won't have time for any nonsense. Family, I've read them all. Any issue you got with the church, there's a one another for that. There's a one another for that. Somebody comes to you with drama, tell them, yo, there's a one another for that, man. (laughs) We could be like Apple, right? There's an app for that. There's a one another for that. Can we just stand? Can we just pray? Can we pray with one another? Can we close in worship with one another? Can we greet one another as we leave him? Can we encourage somebody, one another, as we walk out of this place? Can we? The word says greet one another with a holy kiss. Let's not take it too far. Let's start small. Start small. Father, we thank you that you chose us to be the church. Probably not the best people for the job. Probably not the easiest people to get along with. Probably not the easiest, uh, most talented bunch to, to, (coughs) to carry out what you asked us to carry out. Definitely not the most qualified ones, Lord. But Jesus, we pray that we would be one. Your prayer was that we would be one. Father, let that be our prayer today. That we would be one. That we would understand what it's like to be members of one another. That if someone's hurting here, we're all hurting. That if someone's looking for their family that they haven't heard from in Puerto Rico, we're all concerned about that family that's missing right now in Puerto Rico. And Father, we lift them up right now wherever they are, whatever they're going through. Father, we ask you right now to silence the violence in Puerto Rico. Father, that the one another, that a spirit of one another would cover that island right now and and they would not be stealing from one another and, and, and assaulting one another and robbing from one another, but that they would start one anothering one another, caring for one another. Father, let that spirit fall on the island right now. In Mexico, in the ruins, Lord God, let them one another, one another, encourage and help and, and, and put their, their families before themselves, God, and search and rescue and build and, and, and comfort. Father, help us to be the church that you think we can be. Help us to manifest that thing that you call out in us, Lord God. That we would be one, Lord. 